What I can say is that although he may have used as an excuse his anger about previous incidents as has been indicated. At least, in the press, and as Chief Brown I think indicated. In no way does that represent what the overwhelming majority of Americans think. Americans, to a large degree, want to make sure that we have a police force that is supported. Because they know our police officers do a really tough, dangerous job. and witness the professionalism of our Dallas police officers. As they were being shot at, the fact that they helped to clear the area. They helped to get the fallen and the injured out of there, they were able to isolate the suspect. And that you didn't have other casualties as a consequence of the police shooting back that just gives. you an indication of what a tough job they have and how well they do it on a regular basis. So I think the danger, as I said, is that we somehow suggest that the act of a Troubled individual speaks to some larger political statement across the country. It doesn't. When some white kid walks into a church and shoots a bunch of Worshippers who invite him to worship with them, we don't assume that somehow he's making. A political statement that's relevant to the attitudes of the rest of America. And we shouldn't make those assumptions around it troubled. Muslim individual who is acting on their own in that same way. Now, with respect to the issue of guns, I am going to keep on talking about the fact that we cannot eliminate all racial tension in our country overnight.
we are not going to be able to identify ahead of time and eliminate every madman or troubled individual who might. want to do harm against innocent people, but we can make it harder for them to do so. And if you look at the pattern of death and violence and shootings that we've experienced over the course of the last year, or the last five years, or the last ten years I've said this. Before we are unique among advanced countries in the scale of violence that we experience. And I'm not just talking about mass shootings. I'm talking about the hundreds of people who have already been shot this. Year in my hometown of Chicago the ones that we just consider routine. Now, we may not see that issue as connected to what happened in Dallas. But part of what's creating tensions between communities and the police is the fact that police have a really difficult time in communities where they know guns are everywhere. As I said before, they have a right to come home and now they have very little margin of error in terms of making decisions. So if you care about the safety of our police officers, then you can't set aside the gun issue and pretend that that's irrelevant. At the protest in Dallas, one of the challenges for the Dallas Police Department as they're being shot at is because this is an open carry state. There are a bunch of people participating in the protest who have weapons on them. Imagine if you're a police officer and you're trying to sort out who is. shooting at you and there are a bunch of people who have got guns on them. In Minneapolis, we don't know yet what happened, 
but we do know that there was a gun in the car that apparently was licensed. But it caused in some fashion those tragic events. So, no, we can't just ignore that and pretend that that's. Somehow political or the president is pushing his policy agenda. It is a contributing factor not the sole factor, but a contributing factor to the broader tensions. That arise between police and the communities where they serve. And so we have to talk about that. And as I've said before, there is a way to talk about that that. Is consistent with our Constitution and the Second Amendment. The problem is even mention of it somehow evokes this kind of polarization. And you're right, when it comes to the issue of gun safety, there is polarization between a very intense minority. and a majority of Americans who actually think that we could be doing better when it comes to gun safety. But that expresses itself in stark terms when it comes to legislation in Congress or in state legislatures. And that's too bad. We're going to have to tackle that at some point. And I'm not going to stop talking about it, because if we don't talk about it, We're not going to solve these underlying problems. It's part of the problem. Carol Lee Question, thank you, MR. President. You mentioned San Bernardino and Orlando. And Americans have been warned that similar attacks could happen here in over there in the United States. And obviously what happened this week in Minnesota and Louisiana and Dallas.
these are not necessarily the same types of attacks and the motivations may be different. But, collectively, they're having a real impact on the American public in that there's a real anxiety out there. Where people are genuinely afraid, going about their daily lives, doing routine things. President Obama, right. Question, so my questions are, do you see any sort of common thread in these events? Is this sort of just a new normal? Is there anything that you can do about this? And what's your message to Americans who are genuinely afraid? Because the anxiety just seems to be getting worse, not better. And these attacks keep seeming to happen in much more regularity that wasn't a part of their experience even, say, a year ago. President Obama, well, Carol Lee, I do think we have to disentangle these issues. When it comes to terrorist attacks, people are understandably concerned not just because of what's happening in the United States. But what happened in Brussels, and what's happened in Paris? And what's happened in Turkey, and what is consistently happening in Iraq and Bangladesh and all around the world? And that's why the work that we've done with NATO and our counter-ISIL coalition and other partners is so vital. One of the things that's been commented on is that as ISIL loses territory and the fraud of the caliphate becomes more obvious. they are going to start resorting to more traditional terrorist tactics. They can't govern. They can't deliver anything meaningful to the people whose territory they can control. The one thing they know how to do is kill.
and so we're going to have to redouble our efforts in terms of intelligence, coordination. Our counter-messaging on extremism, working closely with Muslim communities both. overseas and in our own countries to make sure that we are reducing the number of people who are inspired by their message or are in some coordinated fashion, trying to attack us. And obviously, we have built up a huge infrastructure to try to do that. The more successful we are in Iraq and Syria and Libya and other places where ISIL has gotten a stronghold. The weaker they are, the less resources they have, the less effectively they can recruit. But when individuals are willing to die, and they have no conscience and compunction about killing innocent people, they are hard to detect. And it means that we've got to continually up our game. Having said that, I think it is important to note just the success that we've seen in the last several weeks when it comes to rolling back Al-Qaeda. The liberation of Fallujah got a little bit lost in the news, but that's a big town, and with our support. The counter ISIL coalition support, the Iraqi government was able to move through there quickly. They're now positioning themselves so that they can start going after Mosul. In Syria, you're seeing progress along pocket manbij that has been used for foreign fighter flows. And so they're on their heels, and we're going to stay on it. Now, when it comes to crime, generally, I think it's just important to keep in mind that our crime rate today is substantially lower than it was 5 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago.
over the last four or five years, during the course of my presidency. Violent crime in the United States is the lowest it's been since probably the 1960s, maybe before the early 1960s. There's been an incredible drop in violent crime. So that doesn't lessen, I think. People's understandable fears if they see a video clip of somebody getting killed. but it is important to keep in perspective that in places like New York, or Los Angeles, or Dallas, you've seen huge drops in the murder rates. And that's a testimony to smarter policing, and there are a range of other factors that have contributed to that. So that should not we should never be satisfied when any innocent person has been killed. But that should not be something that is driving our anxieties, relative to where we've been in the past. And with respect to, finally, the issue of police shootings. There's no doubt that the visual records that we're seeing have elevated people's consciousness about this. But as I've said before, for African Americans or Latinos in the pre-smartphone age, I don't think that people were not aware of the fact that there is evidence of racial bias in our criminal justice system. It's been well documented, and it's been experienced. And even before I got to the US Senate. when I was in the state senate in Illinois. I passed legislation to try to reduce the incidence of racial profiling by collecting data. And that was prompted by evidence that it was taking place in certain parts of the state. 